Thank Good you. afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Bayside History Museum and our partners, the Calvert Library and the Daughters of the American Revolution who are sponsoring this lecture today, we'd like to welcome you to Damsels in Distress by Dr. Ralph Eshelman. I have a little bit of housekeeping before Ralph starts talking. Please turn your cell phones off. This lecture is being recorded. It will be YouTubed, so be careful if you whisper because Mickey has very high-tech equipment and anything you say will be picked up. <laughs> I'd like to introduce a couple of our elected officials from our towns who are here this afternoon. Larry Jaworski, would you just raise your hand so everyone can know who? Larry is on our town council in Chesapeake Beach. And our wonderful town council member, Mickey Hummel, who has always done the AIT for our lectures. Mickey, he wears two hats today. He's, he's our town council member for North Beach, and he is in charge of everything IT and all the YouTubes. Ralph Eshelman, you could probably, I could spend an hour talking about him, but I will do it in three paragraphs best that I can. Um, he really is a specialist in polar explorations, military, and maritime history. The War of 1812 in the Chesapeake, geology, and vertebrae paleontology. He received his Ph.D. from the University of Michigan with a major in geology and vertebrate paleontology and a minor in ecology. He is most known in this area for being the first director of our Calvert Marine Museum in Solomons. The citizens of this country are so fortunate to have had such a wonderful facility in our midst in Solomons. Ralph is the owner of Eshelman and Associates, which is a cultural resource management consultant firm and partner in lighthouse preservation firms. He's a consultant to the National Park Service during the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812 in the Chesapeake, which resulted in the publication of many books. He's currently working on a new book about the Patuxent River, which will be published by the Calvert Marine Museum. Ralph has many followers and individuals who get to have their adventures via his Facebook posts. So for all of us who follow him on Facebook and enjoy his and Evelyn's ex just it's amazing. We really want to thank you for that because particularly this past week we all got to enjoy a ice encrusted snow covered buffaloes while they were out in Yellowstone. So without further ado, Dr. Ralph Eshelman. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to get you an updated version. Uh, a lot of that stuff that she attributed me is kind of like <clears throat> in the past, so to speak. But what a wonderful turnout. Thank you all for being here on a sunny, actually very nice day. Uh, I appreciate that. And you might ask yourselves, well, based on the introduction, why is this guy talking about mermaids? And the answer is that I used to work in the expedition industry on board ships, and they always needed filler lectures. So if we're going from one place to another, we could sometimes be at sea for like three days. And you don't just talk about where you're going to go, you need some fillers. So a great filler would be to talk about mermaids, because you can do that in almost any ocean. So there's lots of lectures like that that I've kind of done over the years. Um, for this particular lecture, I've kind of toned it down a bit, but I think most of you know that I typically like to do histories. And so what I'm going to do a little bit is talk about how mermaids came about, and it may surprise you uh, that some of the things we talk about today are actually related to how we think about mermaids today. So without further ado, let me go ahead and begin. And the title, Damsels of the Deep, Mermaid Myths and Legends. And the first thing that you might notice here is that that's a typical mermaid that most of us have in our minds. Because a mermaid is what? It's half human, female, and it's half, usually people refer to it as a fish. Sometimes it looks a little reptilian, but that's a typical mermaid. 
And then the one on the right is maybe more typical of what most of us would think about, because here you can actually see what looks like, I would call them scales. This is not quite as clear. It looks more reptilian, to be honest with you. But that's typically what most of us think about when we think about mermaids today. Does this particular painting remind you of anything? It's actually done for a very famous book that probably everybody in this room may have read. Anybody want to hazard a guess? What, what do you think? It's a mermaid. The name of it was The Little Mermaid. Hans Christian Andersen. Hans Christian Andersen. This is one of the illustrations from his book. And that's probably the best well-known book that's ever been written about mermaids. And it doesn't mean that he stuck to the facts, because take a look at that mermaid. And what's that weird dude on the right-hand side? Is that a merman? We're actually going to we're going to talk about mermen as well as mermaids. But it's unusual to me because look at the feet. And what is he holding in his hand? A frog. So when you're writing fiction, you don't need to stick to the facts. <laughs> There's no way that this guy, a merman, could have had a frog, which is a freshwater animal under the ocean. But this is interesting to me because most people who have read Christian's Little Mermaid don't think about mermen. But there were mermen just as much as there were mermaids. And we're going to explore that. So there we go. Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid. How about this? Has anybody ever been to see this actual sculpture? I see some hands and some shaking of the heads. So where are we talking about? Copenhagen. Copenhagen, yep. And I don't know how many of you know, but this sculpture is based on The Little Mermaid. The guy who sculpted it had read the book and decided he wanted to do a sculpture himself. And his it was commissioned by Carl Jacobson, who was the founder of Carlsberg, not the beer Carlsberg, but the town Carlsberg. And his wife served as the model when he did this particular sculpture. And this was in August of 1913. So that sculpture has been there that long. And interestingly, it was decapitated on two different occasions. 1964 and 1997. Why someone would go out and do something like that, I have no idea. But they've always restored it back to its original uh, condition. Now how about this one? I didn't bring it into great detail, so for those of you that have good eyesight, you might make out that that is a mermaid right there. This is a maiden serving the mermaid. But what else do you see there? Can you see the walls? Can you see the polar bear? So where do you think this is? And what do you think would be the culture that would initiate a statue or a sculpture like this? It's Inuit. What, what country are we talking about? Anybody know? It's Denmark, but it's on the island of Greenland. So there you go. This is the sea goddess, Inuit. And just a little bit more information. It's from Nook, Greenland. Anybody here been to Nook? I've actually been fortunate enough to be there several times. It's an interesting place. How many people would ever have thought that this is an image of the protege of what we think of as a mermaid today? And the problem with this is that <clears throat> where is the fish-like lower body? It doesn't exist. Instead, this is a siren. If you go back to some of the early mythology, <clears throat> particularly in Greek and even before that, the early depictions of these types of maidens, if you want to call it that, typically had wings. And if you look at the feet right here, these are bird-like feet. So some of the early myth 
mythological fertility gods depicted women because they're the ones that bear the children, so that's the fertility aspect. But instead of them being depicted as half fish, they were depicted as half birds. And if you go and you look at some of the early languages back from this time, bird and fish have the same name. They were not differentiated. So this creates some issues when you start talking about people in their minds who try to recreate the myths surrounding mermaids. And so you go from a winged, bird-like individual to a fish-like individual. So siren, part woman and part bird creature. Anybody ever hear of a siren? Have you heard of the biological sirenia? Anybody know what the sirenia are? It's the manatees, the dugongs, and the sea cows. Now think about that. Because you're going to find out as we go through this lecture that some of the seafarers saw sirenians and they thought they were mermaids. And so therefore, a siren is the same as a sirenian. <clears throat> and we've already pretty much covered that. This is where I talked about where these can become confused with what we typically think of as mermaids. This is by John William Waterhouse. This is 1891. And this is a depiction of Odysseus. This is in Greek mythology who deliberately sends his vessel to an area where he knew there were sirens because he wanted to experience the lore of the sirens. And what do I mean by the lore of the sirens? Just like mermaids had the ability to attract seamen into the sea, the sirens did the same thing because they had the gift of song. They had the gift of singing so beautifully that supposedly in the mythology they could lure the seamen into the sea. And so what you're looking at here is a later rendition of an artist trying to depict the winged sirens coming down to try to attract the sailors off of the vessel. So what did Odysseus do? All of the men, except for himself, have beeswax in their ears. And if you look around their heads, you can see that they have bandages. And that's to keep them from being able to hear the beautiful songs of the sirens. The only person that doesn't have that is Odysseus himself. And you can see that he's tied to the mast. And he had that done deliberately so that he could not be taken away. Even though he might have had the lore of wanting to join the sirens, he would not be able to do it because he was tied to the mast. Now, where did... Waterhouse, do you think, get the idea for this? And this is a Greek piece of pottery. You can see the vase here on the left, and this is a detail of it. So this is an actual piece of Greek pottery dating from 480 to 470 BC. That's a long time ago. And you can see the sirens. You can see them coming down trying to allure the sailors off of the vessel. And essentially what Waterhouse did <clears throat> is what you see right here on this piece of pottery. The only major difference is that the men do not have the, um, their bandages around their, uh, their ears, but they were in fact, uh, they did have the beeswax. We can go even back further. This is a thousand years BC, and this is a coin. So this is pre-Greek. And if you look at the coin in detail, I don't know if you can make that out, but that is actually supposed to be a woman with a lower half of her body representing a fish. So this is a goddess of fertility. You all know why women are the fertility. But here is one of the earliest depictions of what today we call a mermaid being depicted with the lower half of a fish. So even when we get into the Greek and later when we get into the Roman period, there was still people who were mixing up what these goddesses looked like. Were they half human and half fish, or were they half human and half whatever? Did they have wings, or did they not have wings? 
depending on where you were in the world, uh, there were those kinds of differences. So this is an interesting one. This is from uh, Pliny the Elder. This is 77 AD. So we're talking about here over a thousand years after the last depiction that I showed you. But if you look very closely here, what do you see? You see both sirens and mermaids in the same illustration. And you'll see some that actually represent both. So for example, that is a mermaid. Right there you've got wings, so that's a siren. So here we have both of them being depicted during the time of Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder was a philosopher, a Roman philosopher. And he makes the statement, and I'll read it to you, it's right down here. As for mermaids called nereids, it is no fabulous tale that goeth of them, for look how painters draw them, so they are indeed. Now that's interesting to me for a philosopher. What he's saying to you is that because people depict them in art, they must be true. I don't know that I would believe that, but that's what Pliny the Elder believed back in 77 AD. This is more typical of what we think of as mermaids today. In the last 200 years, almost every time you see something like this, it's going to be half human, female, and the lower half is going to be fish. And you'll also notice one of them is holding a mirror. Oftentimes when you see early depictions of mermaids, they do have mirrors. They like to look at themselves. They want to make sure that their hair is perfectly taken care of and that it's as beautiful as possible. Where did the mirror come from? We're going to talk about that as well. The other thing that's missing here is that oftentimes they would also have a comb. So the early depictions of mermaids were with combs and with a mirror. These are some examples from Delphware. And if you look at the left, you can see that she is holding what you could describe as an orb, or you could call that a mirror. And here's a comb. And then over here, we have a comb. And here's an orb, or what you could call a mirror. So where did the mirror come from? When you think of a mirror, what is the color of it? It's silver. What orb do we have that is silver, that all of these people knew about? It's the moon. So these were not only goddesses of fertility, these were the goddesses of the moon. And so what they were holding was an orb that symbolizes the moon. And then over time, that orb became a mirror. And that's when they introduced the combs and the idea that mermaids have beautiful hair, blah, 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 blah. I think we've already covered that. So here's some more depictions. This is more typical of what most of us might think of. If you look at the one on the left, you see a merman and you see a merwoman, and both of them have musical instruments. So again, this is this idea that they have the ability to sing, to lure semen into the sea, but they also were musically inclined beyond just the ability to sing. Now, in some cultures, even though they could sing, catch the logic here, they could not speak to the seamen. All they could do was to sing and hum tunes or play instruments, but they could not say to the sailor, please come and join me in the sea. That's the tradition. And you'll see that up on the right. Here is a mermaid who has successfully lured a seaman onto the back of her tail, and he is being taken out into the sea. If you look down on the bottom, this is a more traditional type of uh, rendition where you see a mermaid that is trying to lure the seamen into the sea. So she would not be speaking to them. She would be singing and humming to him. Just like the sirens that would come down with the wings would try to do the same thing. <clears throat> if you go back to... 1870s right up to about 1920, 1930s, oftentimes people that were selling things like shampoo, they would pick mermaids with them. Some of you might remember this, maybe your grandparents or your parents might have had some items like that. 
And it all goes back to this idea that the goddess of the moon, that orb turns into a mirror. They had this wonderful hair. So now you use that to help to market your hair products. And this is an example of a hair product with all of these mermaids being shown down in the bottom. Another way to look at some of these early maps is they also had sea dragons and monsters of the sea. But in amongst with these monsters were also mermaids. So if you were a sailor and you're looking at a typical map, this is a map from 1562. In your mind, not only were there sea dragons and sea monsters out there, but there were indeed mermaids. And you would look forward to see a mermaid, particularly if you had been at sea for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> This is uh, St. Brendan. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. It's a mythical, uh, this is an Irish monk who supposedly found the New World before Columbus ever got to the New World. And one of the parts of the, the tradition of St. Brendan is that he saw a mermaid. Oops, let's go back. <clears throat> he saw a mermaid. And what I find interesting is that the artist is depicting the mermaid with a crown as if she were a queen. I've never seen that before. And then over here, part of that myth is that um, Brendan thought that he had seen the island of paradise. And so he landed on the island, and the island turns out to have actually been a sleeping whale that is awakened. And then he's startled to find out that he's not on the island of paradise. He's actually sitting on top of a whale. And then here's another early depiction. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. Let's go back. This is an, another early depiction of, we'll get there once. Oh boy, now we're really getting in trouble. So this is an early depiction of a whale right there. Does that look like a whale to us today? No, it sure doesn't. And probably what's going on here is this might have been baleen that was mistaken for some type of teeth. Because most whales that we think of today have baleen. There are toothed whales, like a sperm whale. But certainly they don't look like sperm whales. So this is another example of some maps. Uh, this is 1532. And again, you can see examples of what they thought were mermaids. Well, I'm really having trouble here. You know what? We're going to skip that map and keep going. Um, these are natural history catalogs that were published in different years. This is a particular one on the left is 1675, the one on the right is 1717, and the one on the upper left is 1727. When you think about it, it's not that long ago. But these were catalogs of what people believed were the animals that lived in the world at that time. So just as much as you could see an armadillo, such as you see right here, they have a mermaid on the next side of the page. And you might look at yourself and say, how is that possible? It's because people at that time believed that mermaids were real. They existed in the ocean. And most people were not adapted to being out at the sea, to have seen what it's really like out there. So many naturalists had never seen a mermaid, but they accepted all of these traditions where people had reported that they had seen these kinds of things. So on the right, you can see a mermaid, and underneath of it, you can see a lobster. So what they're saying to you is that a mermaid was just as much a part of the ocean as were a lobster. And if you look on the upper left, you can see depictions of different types of fish. The fish in the ocean were just as logical to be in the ocean as was a mermaid. We know that not to be the case today. This is a detail of one of those. This happens to be from the Indian Ocean. And I mean, the detail of the lobster is maybe over-exaggerated with the length of its tentacles that is going out. But look at the depiction of the mermaid. This had to be the figment of someone's imagination. Obviously, no one ever saw um, a mermaid, quote unquote, but that's what they came up with. So let's take a look at some of the early people who explored on the oceans. All of you are familiar with Christopher Columbus. How many of you know that Christopher Columbus described a mermaid? He claimed that he saw a mermaid. And this is how he described it in 1493. 
saw three sirens that came up very high out of the sea. They are not as beautiful as they are painted, since in some ways they have the face of a man. Interesting. Let's continue. Could he possibly have been looking at a siren? Yeah. And think about where he was traveling. He was coming from Europe over to the New World, primarily in the Southern Hemisphere. And more than likely, he was looking at something like a manatee, a dugong, a sea cow, or something like that. And through his imagination, and the fact that he couldn't see it probably in great detail, he thought it was a mermaid. Because how many seamen even knew about dugongs? How many seamen even knew about what we call Cyrenia today? But they did know about mermaids. So they confused it. And that's what we think probably is what Christopher Columbus was doing. And the reason I've got the green is in there is because a lot of these early depictions claim that the mermaids had green hair. Well, Cyrenians eat seagrass. And oftentimes you'll have seagrass in their mouth. And could they have confused that to think that the hair of the mermaid was actually green? Another one, John Smith. Everybody here has heard of John Smith. How many of you know that he also thought that he had seen a mermaid? And here's a description. Large eyes, rather too round, a finely shaped nose, and a little too short, well-formed ears, rather too long, and her long green hair imparted to her an original character by no means unattractive. I love this part began to experience the first effects of love. John had definitely been at sea for a long time. Does that give you a different perspective of John Smith? And again, it was probably a Cyrenian, and in this case, probably a manatee. And then we can go to the different types of Cyrenians in 1567 mermaids were caught in fishnets off the coast of Ceylon. And I love this. They did an autopsy. And in the relations of the Society of Jesus, they came up that anatomically and spiritually they were identical to humans. But they obviously had to be these Cyrenians that we were talking about. And then lastly, Henry Hudson. Hudson River, Hudson Bay, named after one of the great explorers. This is how he described a mermaid. One of our company, looking overboard, saw a mermaid, and calling up some of the company to see her, one more of the crew came up. From the navel upward, her back and her breasts were like a woman's. Her body was as big as one of us, her skin very white, long hair hanging down behind of color black. In her going down, they saw her tail, which was like that of a porpoise, and spectacled like a mackerel. Now this is in 1608. And so what potentially could it have been? Not a Cyrenian, but a beluga-toothed whale. I mean, that fits the description pretty well. And you can see the spectacled tail, particularly up on the right. That's a norwhale, by the way. Uh, the beluga is off here on the right. But it was probably one of these small toothed whales that Hudson would have seen back in those parts of the world. They weren't mermaids. The Virginia Gazette in 1738, that's our neighboring state, had this article. And this is about a mermaid that was found off the southwest coast of England. And it says, fishermen near that city, Exeter, if you're familiar with that, it's kind of near Bristol, down in that area, drawing their net ashore, a creature of human shape having two legs, leaped out and ran away very swiftly. Not being able to overtake it, they knocked it down by throwing sticks at it. At their coming upon it, it was lying and groaned like a human. Creature, its feet were webbed like a duck. It had eyes, nose, mouth, resembling those of a man was somewhat depressed, tail not unlike a salmon, turning up towards its back, and it's four feet high. It had been publicly shown here by the name of mermaid, and multiples of people go to see it. 
wouldn't you have loved to have been around at that time to have the opportunity to go what, see what this creature was? I have no idea what it was, but it certainly was not a mermaid. Does this surprise you? This is an illustration out of the Bible. This is the Nuremberg Bible. We're talking about 1483. And here you can see Noah's Ark. And what do you see in the sea? Around it. What do you see? A house. You see a house. Yeah, there's a house right there. Oh, hit the wrong button again. Well, now we're really in trouble. <laughs> Here, let's keep going. Oh no, I'm sorry, guys. This is. I'm, He's going forward, not back. Oh, what, what slide do you want to get to? I'm going. To, I was trying to go back. No, it's gone. The upper. For some reason, it's not going back. I don't know why. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but if you look in the water, what do you see over on the left, lower left? Fine. You see a mermaid. Um, what do you see in the middle? Right here. What do you think? A seal. A seal? That's very good. But they called it a sea dog. But it, it, that's what we would think of as a seal today. Because a seal kind of looks like a dog, doesn't it? And then. You can argue if that's a mermaid or a merman off on the right-hand side. But this is 1483, showing all of the animals of the world. And they didn't need to be on the ark because they're in the ocean. Because of the flood, you don't need to be on the ark. And then look at all of the birds. Now, some of those birds are seabirds. But some of the land birds, they had to have a birdhouse up on the top to accommodate the land birds because they had no place to land. So it's really interesting when you follow this kind of stuff. So here are mer folk. So I'm showing you now depictions of mermen and mermaids. And the logic behind this was that some people back in the 15th, 16th, even 17th century believed that just like we had diversity of different types of people on land, we had diversity of different types of people on the sea. So there weren't just mermaids, there weren't just mermen. There were also things like mermonks. There were probably monks, because they needed to have Christianity as well to organize them and make sure that they were doing the right thing and whatnot. And I know some of you have this puzzled look on your face, but if we keep going here, um, this is a Russian depiction of a merman and a mermaid. And look at all of these different creatures right here. So here we have like a, I don't know if you want to call that a horse with a lion body with wings. Uh, okay. Um, all these different types of depictions that people believed were in the sea. And here are some mer monks. You see how the, the upper two on the left, those were mer monks. Um, the one on the right, I have no idea what that's supposed to be. Um, but it's just very interesting how your imagination can take over. And we can even go to places like up in the upper left-hand side. That is a mermaid, I believe. And this is in a church in England. And I, when I gave this lecture, an individual came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I pass by that church every day when I used to go to work. And I never even knew that was there. And so he went when he got home and sent me a photograph of what I had showed him in a lecture. And then down on the bottom, just to show you that it's not just men and women and dogs, but here you're looking at what looks like some type of an antlered animal. And so this would be like a mer deer that existed in the, in the ocean, according to some people. Um, this is an example of a mere goat. And this is from a Greek temple located in Rome. So you can see the, the horns of the goat right here, and you can see the fish body out through there. So almost every type of an animal that lived on land, according to some people, they believed it also existed in the ocean. There are family crests that use a mermaid. 
And this is an example of two of them. These are some more uh, Dutch tiles showing different depictions of mermaids. And the dates of these are primarily 17th century. This is uh, from another church in England. This dates from 1187. And you can see the mermaid right here. Here's the orb that we would call a mirror. Here's the comb. And here's the fish lower body right there. So what's interesting to me is this is 1187, carved by somebody, and this is in this particular church. And these are some more depictions. This is a, um, a bearded merman, right here. And down here you can see a merman. And this is the more traditional mermaid. And right here, is that the orb that she is holding? Is that the mirror that she's holding? It probably is. And this is almost certainly a comb. And then even tavern signs. And it meant different things back then. It also meant a place where you could get food. You could also get women there. How about... P.T. Barnum. Everybody knows about this guy. And he specialized in bringing to the public all kinds of weird stuff, and he made money from it. And this is what it looked like. This was his museum that he had in New York City, right here. You can see it's a pretty large museum. How many of you know that the Peel Museum in Baltimore was the first building in North America built specifically to house a museum. And that building still stands, and it opened in 1814, and over its short years that it operated, they had a Fiji mermaid on display in there. So you could have gone to Baltimore and have seen a, a mermaid during the War of 1812. Not many people did, but you had the opportunity. So here's the Fiji mermaid, and this was really brought to popularity primarily by, by Barnum. And the question is, what was the Fiji mermaid? Well, it turns out that there's many, many, many Fiji mermaids that have existed. I once went to an antique shop in uh, Seattle, Washington, and in the antique shop, they had a Fiji mermaid. If you go to Delaware, to the Dutch Museum, uh, <coughs> Don, do you remember the name of that museum? The Swanendale? Yeah, yeah, Swanendale Museum. They have a Fiji mermaid on exhibit there. You can go see it. Uh, these are all fake. Uh, these are some of the advertisements to get people to come in. And you think about, we're talking about in the late 1700s and the 1800s, even in the early 1900s. And if they were charging anything from a nickel early on, to 25 cents later, they can make a lot of money depending on how many people would turn up to come in and see what they thought was a mermaid, when in fact they weren't mermaids at all. So what are they? They've actually done a lot of research on these things. And most recently, this is a Punch magazine, if you guys are familiar with that, it's a very humorous uh, magazine that has a lot of cartoons. And what they're trying to show here is Two real mermaids, specifically raged, the only tame whale in existence. In other words, they're, they're putting a spoof on all of this stuff to try to get people to come to see these ridiculous things, which included mermaids. So these are actual pictures of quote-unquote Fiji mermaids that existed all around the world. And one of the things that you're going to be able to notice with every one of these is that the body is significantly different from the tail. The upper torso is very different from the tail. So take a look at all of these and you'll begin to see some similarities. In every case, what you're looking at, particularly in this one, I think you can see it best, that's an actual fish that's been attached to something else. Usually it's a monkey. So what they typically did is they took part of a monkey and they would stuff it and then they would attach it to a fish. And that was the closest thing that they could get to that they thought would look like a mermaid. So the, the Fiji mermaids were made this way. 
Here's some more examples. And I'm going to bring you right up to date. Oh, these are, these are Fiji mermen. You couldn't just be sexist. You had to have both. And this is from the Swanendale Museum. You can go there today and you can see this if you have this desire to do so. This is Oakland, Maryland. This is Western Maryland. And this is 1937. And this is a woman who, you can see how she has the lower posterior that has been made into what looks like uh, scales. And she would go on exhibit. And the admission fee, which you can see right here, was 10 cents and 15 cents, depending on whether you were a child or whether you were an adult. That was a lot of money in 1937 that you would pay for. So I don't think anybody in this room probably was in Oakland in 1937. But you could have gone and seen the Serpentina Living Mermaid in Western Maryland in 1937. And then, how about mermaids in song? Are you guys familiar with the Eddystone Lighthouse? Here's the first stanza. My father was the keeper of the Eddystone Light. He slept with a mermaid one fine night. Out of this union there came three, a porpoise, a porgy, and the other was me. Yo ho ho, the wind blows free, all through the rhyme of the rolling sea. I'm not going to do the rest of it, but there's mermaids and all kinds of stuff. And I just think it's kind of cute the way this guy's talking about his, his father had a romance with a mermaid and all this kind of stuff. It's fanciful. But how about, uh, let's, let's go back again. How about right here? Norman Rockwell, one of America's greatest artists. And what does he show you? A fisherman who caught a mermaid in a lobster trap. You know, and it's kind of a spoof, but it just shows you how mermaids have really gotten into our culture, whether it's in the United States or other parts of the world. So we're back to Little Mermaid. And I suspect that the children here in this room have all been read or maybe read themselves, The Little Mermaid. You as adults probably read it when you were a child or you read it to your children or whoever. But this is what really spurred what I would call the mermaid cult that we have today. It's primarily through this. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but Walt Disney really popularized this. When Walt Disney did the movies, and there's been a sequel to it, that really is what brought it to where it is today. And then it even got crazier. I'm not going to read all of this to you. But everything you see here is pretty much based on The Little Mermaid. So that one book has resulted in comic books, in movies, in plays, dramas, all throughout American culture and beyond. And then, how about Frederick Stewart Church, one of my favorite artists, who you hardly ever see do something like this. He was a landscape artist. He did these amazing landscapes of primarily North America and South America. But here is his mermaid, 1881. And this is at the National Gallery of Art. It's not always on exhibit, but you can go there oftentimes, and it will be on exhibit. And this is his fanciful way of trying to depict a mermaid interesting in riding on a seahorse. Seahorse? Cool. Yeah, pretty cool. And how about if you've ever been to the National Geographic Society headquarters, on the ceiling is this painting of a mermaid that was done by none other than N.C. Wyeth. And where did N.C. Wyeth live and study? In Delaware, not that far from here. And so National Geographic brought him in 1927 to paint that, as well as some other murals, on their ceiling there. And then this is Howard Pyle. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Howard Pyle, but Howard Pyle started the first, you could call it, school of illustration in the United States. And who was his primary clients? the Wyeth family, including N.C. Wyeth. So when you think about books like Treasure Island, 
That all came out of Delaware through Howard Pyle, and this is his depiction of a mermaid who has enticed a man into the ocean, and the title is called The Mermaid, and this is on exhibit at the Delaware Art Museum, appropriately so, since that's where Wyeth and, and he came from. Uh, we don't need to go into that. So this is Treasure Island, just to give you an idea as to how popular some of these uh, pile and Wyeth images were. And then, if you've ever gone down to Norfolk, they have statues of mermaids all around the city. And you know, Calvert County did something like that. Do you guys remember what it was? Seahorses. Seahorses, yeah. They had a competition, and they had seahorses that people would make, and they had them up all over the county. It was kind of like a tourist attraction, and they did the same thing in Norfolk, and many of them are still there. And then different kinds of beer. I'm going to go have a beer afterwards. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can get a mermaid beer. I hope so. <laughs> and then, how many of you guys ever go to Starbucks coffee? And have you ever looked at their logo over time? I'm not going to go into detail, but if you look at the left, that's the original logo. Clearly a mermaid. And then you can see how it changed to what it is today. Much more modest, for obvious reasons. So we're talking about a change that took place in the logo in 1987 to 1992. How many people knew that? And then you might have remembered uh, in 2004 there was a, a big tsunami. And so people were putting out all kinds of hoax of mermaids that were being found as a result of the tsunami because what they were saying is that the tsunami had washed up all of these mermaids onto the shore. And this is an example of one of the quote unquote mermaids from 2004. And once they did an actual investigation on it, everything in there was fake, as you would expect. But I wanted to show you this one because I don't know if you can read the date, but for those of you that have really good eyesight, can you make out the date right there? Mm -hmm. That's February 16th. That's three days ago. This was in national news three days ago. And this is a mermaid from Japan. And it dates from, let's get to the next page, 1736 to 1741. And they just did an autopsy on it to determine what it really is. And just like all of the rest of them, they found out that the lower portion was a fish and the upper portion was a monkey. And that just came out three days ago. So it's still going on, guys. I mean, it's just amazing. And then, oh, this is just to show you, you, you can kind of pretty much see the differentiation right here. Yeah. You even see how the hands, you can see the, what looks like scales. But when you really get close to it, you can see how these were fake. There's more of a detail. Thanks to uh, our good friend right here, Kent Mountford, who sent me this at, I think it was 11.30 this morning, which I hurriedly put into the show. Um, this is our own mermaid. This is Chessie, actually a manatee, that was found in Flag Harbor in July of 2011. So if you had been, let's say, John Smith at that time, and you saw this manatee in the water, somehow in your mind you would have thought it was a mermaid. But we still have, if you want to call a Cyrenian a mermaid, we have them right here in Calvert County as recently as 2011. And so here's Ogden Nash. Some of you may appreciate his sense of humor. This is 1942, and this is how he wrote of a mermaid. He said, Say not the mermaid is a myth. I knew one once named Mrs. Smith. She stood while playing cards or knitting. Mermaids are not equipped for sitting. <laughs> kind of short, sweet, cute. And I'm not going to read this to you, but this is an interesting play on words. So when you talk about be sure of yourself, sure is spelled S-H-O-R-E. 
and it goes all the way through um, just kind of a, a, a little kind of a, a ditty, you could call it, about mermaids. And then this is our mermaid. Does this person, she's not here, is she by any chance? Mm -hmm. You used to be able to go to the farmer's market right here at North Beach, and she would be on exhibit. How many of you remember that? Some, a couple of you do, yeah. She doesn't do that anymore. She has a Facebook page. She has a Facebook page. This is Angela. Um, she's the girlfriend of uh, Kent Humphrey over here. But she's an attractive lady, and she's actually doing some good things. Uh, she has formed a, uh, a company, I guess you would call it, where she's trying to promote uh, ecology and teaching of children about how to take care of the, the, the oceans and whatnot, and she's doing it through the mermaid kind of a costume and whatnot, which is kind of nice. We were hoping she might be here today. And this is my own personal encounter with a mermaid. And this is a true story. Um, I was in Baltimore, and this was the Baltimore City Museum, which had opened only two years ago. And prior to its opening, they were doing some fundraisers. And so they tried to recreate some of the P.T. Barnum ridiculousness to try to attract attention. And when you walked into this special opportunity uh, pre-opening, they had a mermaid in a tank in the opening room that you would first go into. And this is not Angela, although it kind of looks like her, but I don't think it's Angela. Uh, it could be. But anyway, this is my encounter with her. <laughs> I have to tell you, I instantly fell in love. <laughs> and my heart still pulpates whenever I see this image. Um, so mermaids are special to me as well. And I just wanted to leave you with a thought. Seals are not just dog mermaids. Think about it. And this young man right here, you get a star because you identified the sea dog. Yeah, the seal. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I've never heard what happened to men when they were dragged into the sea. <laughs> I didn't but want you to. did mention yeah. that it would, the mermaid would tear the man to pieces. I didn't. We had young people in the audience. I, I didn't want to go into that kind of detail. But the, the mermaids in our culture are loving creatures. If you go back in myth, they were not. They were, uh, it was all a ruse to get the men in the water or to cause them to go to sleep. And then they would be attacked by the mermaid. But that's what the tradition was. But today, we try to make the mermaid into a, a much more friendly and the fact that, you know, Angela is using the mermaid to help children become aware of cleaning up the oceans and whatnot, I think that's kind of a nice little trade-off. So, any other thoughts or comments? Well, so I'm wondering if it's, uh, is it providing a little joy and then it does it because of the mermaid that's going there? And I think Yeah, you have such a mild voice. Oh. And I don't have good hearing. <laughs> I was saying maybe they were, um, I don't know if everyone could hear that, but the analogy was that maybe the mermaids were trying to bring the men into the water because they were doing harm in different places on Earth. Um, that's that's kind of a, a logical conclusion. I've never heard that in any of the mythology, but are you saying that the men who would have war and take over other countries and all these other needs. This is a way for the women to get back to them. I like the analogy. I like it. I hadn't heard why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're being so logical. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? Well, maybe they were being enticed so that they could father the next generation of them. Well, there are. I don't know if anybody heard that. Maybe the mermaids, they needed a man to come 
so that they could get progeny for themselves because they needed to pass on, right? But then once that fertility happens, they don't need the man anymore, so you get rid of them. Are there any living mermaids today? Are there any living mermaids today? Well, I was not going to say this, but since you brought it up, I noticed when there's one woman, I'm not going to look deliberately at her, when she came in today, I noticed that the hem of her dress was a little bit damp. <laughs> and that is, that's one of the first signs. So it's very possible that we have a mermaid in the audience right now. Did you ever see an illustration of a mermaid Suckling a mermaid baby? I, the question was, have I ever seen a mermaid suckling a baby? I have not. But I did, I didn't show it, but there is one fake Fiji mermaid, uh, but it's a merman that has a baby next to it. It's a baby merman. I guess you call it a baby merboy. So somebody did do that, but I've never seen a nursing a mermaid, which. That's an interesting thought as well, isn't it? Yeah. There was an Ethel Merman. <laughs> At this point, I think we've had enough. Thank you all very much for showing up the Christmas.